In position. Good visual. Driver's marked. Copy. Three, two, one. Rise and fall of Splinter Cell, as well as the future of the franchise. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell spawned a successful franchise of stealth shooter games that have been entertaining gamers since 2002. When the first game of the series was released, it was a massive commercial success. The gameplay was praised by critics and fans alike, and both the console and PC games of the franchise were quite positively received. The franchise was once thought of as Ubisoft's flagship franchise, and within the first 10 years, the game has sold over 31 million copies. One of the greatest assets to the game was the innovative gameplay and the kick-ass protagonist, Sam Fisher. So, why then has this successful franchise gone into a long hibernation? Well, since 2013, there's been no additions to the series, and there are some serious reasons behind it. The Splinter Cell games revolutionized the stealth action genre, but over time, the games just started to lose their bite, and the popularity became quite shaky. Like many other successful gaming franchises, the quality could not be maintained as well, and many other issues led to the downfall of the series. In this video, we have brought to you some of the best and worst of the franchise. We will take you through some of the most successful games of the series had to offer, and we'll also explore the flaws that led to its fall. If you want to know whether there's any future possibilities in the series, sit tight and watch till the end. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, 2002. This was the first game to be released and was developed by Ubisoft Montreal. It was built on Unreal Engine 2 and was released for Xbox, PS2, GameCube, Game Boy Advance, and Microsoft Windows. It was personally endorsed by author Tom Clancy, and the game took inspiration from the Metal Gear Solid games. The plot follows former U.S. Navy SEAL Officer Sam Fisher, who has just joined the National Security Agency. He is taken into a new division, called the Third Echelon, and one of his old friends, named Irving Lambert, leads this team. Fisher is sent to investigate the mysterious disappearance of two CIA officers and he heads to Georgia, where the officers went missing. Fisher discovers that the agents have been killed by the government because they uncovered their plans for ethnic cleansing in the region. The Georgian president, Nikolads, goes underground once the NATO forces are sent in, but Third Echelon picks up data exchange between the presidential palace and a Caspian oil rig. Fisher is tasked to recover this data, and in the course of the investigation, he finds out about a mole in the CIA. Soon, North America is under a massive cyber attack conducted by Nikolads, who declares war on the US and its allies. Nikolads just declared war on the US. Sam Fisher uncovers a lot more, from Chinese involvement to double agents, and the climactic moments of the game have some shocking revelations. It turns out that there's a nuclear bomb placed somewhere in the US, and as you would expect, the National Guard finds it out and defuses it. Eventually, the evil President Nikolaz is killed, and the world is once again at peace. It was intended to be a James Bond-type game, and the development team desperately wanted a teen ESRB rating. Thus, the violence have been toned down considerably, but that doesn't stop the adrenaline rush that you experience throughout the whole game. So, what is so special about this game? Well, for starters, you get to do stuff like stalk the villains instead of just shooting them. You can interrogate people, hold them at gunpoint, and strategize accordingly when you are surrounded by several of the baddies. The plot is quite intriguing, and the missions are quite challenging. You have to constantly enter enemy territories, and seek out the secrets of the enemy without blowing your cover. From hacking into computers to sneaking around in the dark, this game offers a different kind of thrill than the usual shoot 'em ups Overall, there are nine missions and the gameplay can take you hours to complete. The graphics were also quite impressive, and we loved the photorealistic backgrounds, people, and objects. The use of light and shadow makes for some stunning visuals, and the controls are quite easy to master. If you're looking to play the spy and want to experience the best of the franchise, give this game a try. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, Pandora Tomorrow, 2004. This game was released for Xbox, PS2, Microsoft Windows, and the Game Boy Advance. The plot followed a similar theme as the first one, 
And this time, the game takes off as we see the United States has established a military presence in the newly independent country called East Timor. The U.S. task is to train their army to fight the guerrilla Metalias, mainly the Dara Dandoa, which is led by Suhadi Sadono. Sedono was previously trained by the CIA to fight communism, but over time, he grew quite resentful of the U.S. policies. He masterminds a suicide bombing and other attacks on the U.S. Embassy, and many military and diplomatic personnel are captured. Among the captured men is Douglas Shetland, who happens to be an old friend of Sam Fisher. Fisher is sent into the Embassy to gather intelligence on the whereabouts of the Dara Dandoa. He does manage to help the U.S. take back the Embassy, but Sedono escapes. The U.S. Army tries to hunt him down in Indonesia, but the Indonesian government seems keen on protecting Sedono. This is when Sam Fisher uncovers the real plan of Sedono. He learns that he wants to use biological bombs with the smallpox virus on U.S. soil. The U.S. forces cannot kill him because if he is detained or killed, the explosives will go off, instantly killing millions. So, Fisher now infiltrates the Dara Dandoa and extracts the locations of the bombs. Long story short, Fisher helps in finding the bombs, and eventually, he captures Sedono. Sedano's capture by U.S. intelligence effectively marks the end of the incident in Indonesia. The last biological bomb was still on the loose, but Fisher gets to it before it can be detonated. This game takes all the best bits of the first Splinter Cell and makes them better. Yes, you still play as the iconic hero Sam Fisher, and you are still the expert spy who can infiltrate the toughest of enemy strongholds. However, this time, much of the action is outdoors. The developers have outdone themselves with some fascinating environments, and the artificial intelligence is significantly better than the first game. Remember how you could hold an enemy hostage when facing several of them? Well, this time around, even the enemy can do the same with civilians. Another thing that makes the game play a bit more challenging is that if the enemy spots you, they no longer have to run to sound the alarm. All they do is simply push a button on their uniform, and soon, every enemy around you will have a bulletproof vest on. It gets significantly harder than the original game, and even those who mastered the first one will have some trouble moving past the levels. The graphics are still quite incredible as before, and the story is as good as the original, if not better. There are some new weapons available this time and they offer you a greater advantage. The objectives are quite varied and quite imaginative. It also adds to the interesting locations and backdrops. This game requires patience and intelligence, and for many, this is rightly the best Splinter Cell in all of the series. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, 2005 this game was released for Xbox, PS2, Microsoft Windows, and there was also a handheld version for both mobile and Nintendo. This time around, the game gets a darker tone than the predecessors, and the combat options are a lot more. The plot is premised in the year 2007, when there are some tensions between China, Japan, and North Korea regarding Japan's formation of an information self-defense force. Chinese and North Korean forces enable a blockage in the Yellow Sea, against Japanese shipping, and as an ally, the U.S. dispatches the USS Clarence to help the Japanese. Meanwhile, an American programmer named Bruce has been kidnapped by a Peruvian group, and Sam Fisher is sent to locate him. Bruce was working to decipher the weaponized algorithms of a superweapon, and Fisher must ensure that these do not get into the wrong hands. He fails to stop Bruce's death, but the investigation soon takes him to New York to a man who worked with Bruce. Your goons tortured him to death, and I'm holding you responsible. North Korea fires a missile to sink the USS Clarence, but they claim that it was unintentional. No, maybe it was an accident, maybe a, an exercise, a test launch gone wrong. That's impossible. Sam Fisher checks out the missile battery and realizes that they're telling the truth. He goes through many more spying missions and finally brings the men responsible behind the attacks to justice, thus preventing a major global war. The game is not the highest ranked one in the series, but it does come with some positives. For example, the storyline, yet again, is watertight. The idea of the computer virus being behind the possibility of World War III and Sam Fisher trying to stop the mayhem is quite intriguing. Next up, the graphics are not disappointing, and there are times where the game looks too good to be true. The stealth features are still there, but somewhere the finesse is missing. The problem with this game was that there were some bugs that caused issues. 
quick loading the game could be a problem, and the game saving methods missed a few tricks. We loved the introduction of the noise meter, where if you make too much noise, you draw the enemy to you. There are no complaints regarding the gameplay as such, and you can master it after just a few tries. Once again, we would not recommend this game unless you have bucket loads of patience. This game did not exactly set the business soaring, but that was probably because the market offered some solid competition during the release of this one. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Double Agent 2006 There are two separate versions of this game. One of them was released on the Xbox 360, PS3, and Microsoft Windows, while the other was released for the PS2, the Xbox, and the Nintendo GameCube as well as the Wii. Although the general plot is the same, the twists and levels vary in the two versions. This time around, Sam Fisher is a wreck. The only thing that he cherished in life was his daughter, Sarah, who was killed in a car accident. To keep him distracted from his pain, his boss assigns him a new mission, where he has to go undercover and infiltrate a terrorist organization called the JBA. The organization aims to overthrow the American government by any means possible, and Fisher must make sure that his cover is still intact till he can destroy the JBA. His boss, Irving Lambert, puts him into the same prison cell as a member of the organization, and they escape from prison together. Now, Sam must find out about their plans and ruin them all the while staying undercover. This game will rank among one of the more intense games of the franchise, but it is certainly not as challenging as some of the others. There are a few tough moments in the course of the game, but overall, the difficulty of the game is manageable. We did love the level in New York, where you have to deal with the guards who are equipped with night vision. One good thing about the game is that the replay value is quite high, because you can change the story and choose either JBA or NSA. We were impressed with how the enemy had gotten smarter this time, and uses flashlights while patrolling in the dark. However, it will be a lot more fun when Ubisoft develops a game where the patrolling routes are arbitrary. Those who have played Chaos Theory will find the controls simple enough, but the style of graphics is somewhat odd. It is a new style, but honestly, the old one was better. Splinter Cell Double Agent is a decent game, but could be better without these flaws. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Essentials 2006 The Splinter Cell game was released for the PlayStation Portable handheld system, and this was one of the major drawbacks in the franchise. The story starts off with Sam Fisher being portrayed as a former NSA agent who is now on the run. He secretly sneaks into a cemetery in Washington, D.C., where his daughter was buried after the car accident. However, during his visit, he is arrested and taken into custody. The NSA interrogates him at the headquarters, and the story takes you backward. We get to witness a mission back in 1992, when Sam Fisher had disobeyed the orders of his superiors to save a captured commanding officer, Douglas Shetland. However, towards the end, Sam confesses to killing his third echelon handler, Irving Lambert. The final mission of the game has you break out of the NSA headquarters after stealing some valuable evidence. The story probably gives away all that is wrong with this game. It feels rushed, and the makers were desperate to use the popularity of the franchise to deliver a game quickly. The narrative takes place shortly after Double Agent, and the plot lacks clarity. Even the performance suffers a bit and it doesn't exactly run smoothly. One of the greatest assets of the franchise, the brilliant visuals, is missing in this game. We did like the voice changing level, but overall, it was a dismissal experience. Basically, the idea was to take some missions from the previous games and mix them up slightly while adding new ones. Well, it backfired, and the response was nothing to write about. The controls were rocky, and some oppressively dark levels were quite a pain in the ass. It gets quite frustrating, especially for those who have witnessed the fluent gameplay found in the earlier games. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Conviction 2010 The story is premised three years after this stint as a double agent. Sam Fisher has quit his job in third echelon, and when he returns out of hiding, he discovers a shocking secret. His daughter's death 
might not have been a mere accident, and it could have been orchestrated by sinister powers. He decides to uncover what actually happened to his daughter, but soon finds himself caught in a far greater conspiracy. The security of the United States is threatened once again, and he must prove that he still has it in him to protect the country. This game was initially revealed in 2007, and it claimed to be a social stealth-based game. Unlike the previous ones, which were light and shadow stealth, it wasn't well received by the fans and soon disappeared from the markets. Later, it reappeared with a new direction and focused on the light and shadow stealth once again. The response was better, but it still didn't quite feel like a Splinter Cell game. The entire storyline comes across as one giant mission, and the gameplay is quite intense. The problem is that there isn't enough sneaking around, and it's quite focused on the shooting thrills. The plot is gripping, but it is also somewhat implausible. This causes confusion when you're playing the game. The voice acting, which is one of the strengths of the franchise, is on the decline. What hurt us most of this game was the rugged gameplay and the fact that it's so action-driven. Seriously, does nobody care about the sentiments of the fans who loved the stealth aspect of the Splinter Cell so much? Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Blacklist 2013 For the fans of the Tom Clancy Splinter Cell games, this was a great comeback for the franchise. After a few dismal games, this was like a breath of fresh air. Unfortunately, it did not do that well in terms of business, and this is where the series was brought to a standstill. The game follows the events of Splinter Cell Conviction, and Third Echelon has been disbanded. The remnants are brought under a newly formed organization called Fourth Echelon, and Sam Fisher is appointed as their commander. Now that he is back in the game of protecting his country, he has his task cut out for him. A deadly terrorist group called the Engineers, led by Majid Sadiq, is a great threat to the United States. This group threatens to conduct a series of terrorist attacks in the country if the soldiers from foreign bases are not pulled out. They must take down the organization and its sinister leader before it's too late. Our first view after playing this game was that Sam Fisher is back. He was back working for the country, and the series was back from the doldrums with another engaging game. What the game does best is that it brings back some of the best memories from Chaos Theory and Conviction. There is a lot more freedom for the gamer, and you can approach a mission in three different ways. Ghost, Panther, or Assault. The first one is a non-lethal stealth based, while the second one is lethal stealth. The last one is absolute mayhem, and you cause as much carnage as possible. You have to use your brains while playing this game, and find covers and strategize tactfully. Now you have more control over Sam Fisher and his gadgets, and you can use this to your advantage. We loved the addition of a flying drone that can fire knockout darts and also distract the enemy. However, the enemies also have their own drones, so you have to stay clear of them. The detailed graphics are back as well, but we would have appreciated the difficulty level to be a bit steeper. The missions are challenging, but they don't make you sweat it out. One major drawback of the game is the absence of Michael Ironside, the legendary actor who was the voice of Sam Fisher for all this time. Otherwise, it is still a must-play for all the fans of the franchise, and it is still a great tragedy that the series was stalled after this one. <laughs> Fall of Splinter Cell Franchise Where's the series now? The franchise enjoyed steady goodwill among the fans, but over the years, the popularity seemed to be on the decline. As of now, it has been nearly a decade since we had seen a Splinter Cell game release, with Blacklist being the last one of the series. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Blacklist was not the worst of the series, and some critics and gamers had some positive reviews about it. However, it was far from the sales expectations that Ubisoft had for it. It sold around 2 million copies, but they were expecting it to go far beyond 5 million. The character of Sam Fisher has been used a couple of times in other Ubisoft games, and clearly he is still quite popular in the gaming universe. This gives us hope that Ubisoft would not just forget about this iconic character. One of the reasons for them to revive the Dead franchise would be to utilize the popularity and relevance of the character of Sam Fisher. He was voiced by none other than the legendary villain Michael Ironside, and his fans are pretty vocal about their support for him. They would only appreciate a change if said change is quite mind-blowing. 
It would be fair to say that Ubisoft is trying to create the foundation for the stealth man Sam Fisher. They are a company that is known to be extremely tenacious about their games. They are working on games that should long have been cancelled, so it would be quite uncharacteristic of them to simply give up on such a successful franchise. However, it is also true that Splinter Cell is unlike most of the games that Ubisoft has published in the last seven years. What we want in the next Splinter Cell game. If we do get a Splinter Cell game in the future, here are some expectations from that. First things first, we want the story to be strong and detailed. The plot has always been a strength of the franchise, and we wouldn't want any changes in that department. It would be a delight to have Michael Ironside back as the voice actor for the character of Sam Fisher as well. We don't want to undermine the work of Eric Johnson did in Blacklist, but Michael Ironside is clearly leagues ahead of his competition. If he reprises the role, it would be a great selling point of the game. Often, the Splinter Cell storylines are a bit far away from reality. It is always fun to save the world from nuclear disasters and other deadly terrorist organizations, but a narrative closer to reality would be appreciated by the gamers. One of the most important things that we would have to have in this game is the old style of stealth. There can be good options regarding how to complete the mission, but the choice to go stealth mode can be a golden addition to the gameplay. For most of the fans of this franchise, the stealth mode was a memorable moment in the gameplay, and the modern consoles can better the experience. In contemporary games, stealth has come a long way, so the developers will have to go a step up in their game. If they keep these things in mind, a Splinter Cell game can still capture the markets as they used to in their prime. Your men are after the water filtration plant. Why? Go to hell. Future of Splinter Cell Franchise We wouldn't be offering you any false hope if we didn't genuinely think that it was a possibility. So, let us start by saying that we personally believe that the Splinter Cell Franchise will make a comeback in one way or another. There have been times in the recent past that some of the top brass of Ubisoft have been vocal about their interest in developing a new Splinter Cell game. Their CEO, Yves Gilmot, stated back in 2017 that they surely have the Tom Clancy games on their mind. They were simply too busy at the time to focus on another Splinter Cell. But that doesn't mean that the franchise is forgotten. In 2019, Julian Garrity, the creative director behind Ubisoft, announced that he was working on a Splinter Cell game. This was the last we had heard about the new game, but there's been a deal between Netflix and Ubisoft to develop an animated series based on the Splinter Cell franchise. We are not saying that a future game will be dependent on the success of the animated series, but its popularity will definitely inspire Ubisoft to quicken the process of bringing a new game to us. Sam Fisher and Splinter Cell combined together is too good of a property to leave behind, and if they develop a new game in the right way, it can be an absolute showstopper. May the gaming gods bless us with this one.